Hello, travelers, and welcome to the Traverse of Stars podcast. This is a kick ass show, everybody, because we have Bruce Horak. You know him as Commander Hammer in Star Trek Strange New Worlds now on Paramount Plus. Now, come join me as we go traversing the stars. Hello, Mr. Horak. Thank you so much for coming to the Traverse of the Stars podcast. Ah, thanks for having me. Nice oh, it's to totally here. my pleasure. I love Strange New Worlds. You are awesome, and I want to appreciate hey. it. Yay. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. So I always start off with a question of inspiration. So we're going to start with this one as well. Uh, what inspired um, you to become an actor and who are your earliest influences? Well, I come from a pr pretty uh, artistic family. So um, that was kind of in the blood, really. My dad was a high school English teacher and a drama teacher. And uh, my oldest brother is an actor. And I have a brother who's a musician. And I have a brother who's a visual artist. And my mom is a writer. So yeah, I was just always surrounded by, by uh, the arts growing up and certainly in the performing arts. I saw a play. It came to my school, my elementary school, when I was in like grade three or grade four, and they brought us to the gymnasium and the space had been transformed into a theater. And I just thought, wow, this is the most amazing thing. So I started writing plays and screenplays in elementary and junior high school and then got into theater that way. So uh, yeah, I'd say those, those, those working actors who were touring to elementary schools and setting up shows in the gymnasium at uh, seven thirty in the morning. That was, that was a huge in influence for me for sure. Yeah. You know, it sounds like your entire family can make its own movie. You have musician, <laughs> you have a writer, you have actors. Oh, you yeah. literally can make your yeah. own film just with you guys. Oh yeah. No, the Horak family reunions were, were all about, you know, getting up and uh, dancing for grandma. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so you were basically like born a performer. Pretty much, yeah. I don't know. It may have even started in the womb. I'll have to ask mom that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I so I read some interesting stories about you. Great. Um, one, 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 <laughs> hopefully, no. Um, no. Uh, uh, the first story actually I read was that, um, as you know, um, as many people who have read your bio may know, so you lost ninety percent of your eyesight as a child due to cancer. Yes. So the question I had about that is, how does that experience change you as an individual? Wow, that's a that's a that's a deep question. Um, yeah, I, I lost uh, probably ninety one percent of my eyesight. So my right eye was removed when I was eighteen months of age, and then my left eye was blasted with radiation to to kill off the cancer. And um, you know, I I'm the youngest of four boys, so you know, growing up in a household of all boys, we just you know we're very competitive, and uh, but also they they just encourage me to to keep up basically. So. You know, I went to an integrated school back back in like the early 80s. Um, it was phasing out the idea of, of kids with disabilities going off to separate schools. So mm. I went to an integrated school. So all of my friends, everybody that I went to school with was was fully sighted and, and able bodied. So I was, you know, I was just encouraged at a very young age. It was, you know, this is a sighted world. And as a person with limited eyesight, you have to figure out how to keep up. And so I found all the tricks that I possibly could. And like, you know, most kids, I just wanted to fit in. So I found mm -hmm. as many, as many tricks uh, as I could in order to appear to be sighted. And I think that just kind of led into a career in the in theater, really. It's all mm. about, it's all about pretending. It's all about faking it. So uh, <laughs> I just kind of figured out how to fake being sighted. And, and it was interesting that, you know, most of my career I spent trying to figure out how to appear to be sighted, and then along comes Star Trek, and they say, we, we're looking for an actor who's blind or visually impaired to play a blind alien, and I was like, wow, <laughs> this is amazing. Like, I actually I actually get to use some of that lived life experience to mm. inform from uh, my character portrayal. Like, what a, what a bizarre twist of occurrence. And, um, mm. you know, it's... Uh, it's it's interesting because Hammer, while he his eyes don't work, it's like he's got this incredible telepathy, so he can actually see better than I can. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think that's what I love about um, New Trek, as it's been deemed New Trek. What I love Trek. about it is that it's such an inclusive franchise now. More than I mean, Star Trek was always I would you could say um, I would say liberal. Um, if you're on some parts, you say woke, but I think it's always been a very liberal, idealistic franchise mm. but the new track i think has gone the next step and made sure to have a plenty of rep representation of as many groups as possible 
Yeah. And I think Hemmer is a great example of that ideal. So for you playing the character and looking at it from a, the, the, from a full cast, a full show, what do you think Hemmer brings to representation in Star Trek? Well, you know, the basis of the, the Enar, at least the, the digging around the research that I, I found was that they, they're a, a subspecies of the Andorian. There is not many of them left. I think at this point, there's maybe a thousand Enar left in the, in the universe. And so he's already kind of got this outsider uh, point of view, which is great. And I think for anyone who's experienced a disability, there's, there's a connection there of feeling like you're, you're kind of a subspecies in a way. And here he is, the chief engineer of the flagship of the Federation. So he's got cachet, but he also has incredible skill, knowledge, mm. know-how. Um, you know, the word that I'm, I'm hearing a lot to describe him is uh, grumpy and uh, curmudgeonly, um, <laughs> perhaps a bit crusty on the outside. Um, and, I, you know, I think that that's certainly an, an element of... Uh, where I can go at times when I'm feeling excluded, when I'm feeling like, you know, I gotta, now I'm gonna have to work twice as hard just to stay in the middle of the pack. And so, you know, somebody questions what I can do or can't do and, uh, you know, starts to put limitations or preconceptions on me. I get a little, my back starts to get up a little bit. And mm. and then I, I work twice as hard just to prove that I can do it and prove them wrong. Mm. Um, so there's that, I think, just at the base core of his motivation that um, I think a lot of, yeah, I think a lot of people, certainly I can relate to. Um, but he's also, as we as we will see, as you know, is coming up. We're going to see there's there's a soft core to our mm. to our crunchy chocolate bar. And, <laughs> uh, there's a nougat filling, um, and it's yeah. I think that they're they're allowing for that depth, for that for that you know the kind of emotional connection that he starts to build, and I think. Um, yeah, it's opening that up. He's not just he's not just playing a stereotype, or he's not just being mm. portrayed as a stereotype. And I really appreciate that. And I think, really, since the start of Star Trek, whatever five hundred million years ago when the franchise started, um, I'm exaggerating for comic effect, but of course, whenever it started, um, you know, they they built those relationships and they built those characters that you know at first glance you're like, oh, you know, Spock's just a robot or whatever. But no, he's got there's so much more to him, mm. and we're expanding that even more now with Strange New Worlds. And I think you know, Hammer gets that same treatment, which is really. Um, yeah, it's really lovely, and it and again, it's just showing the depth of the respect that the writers have, and and the respect that they have for the universe of fans mm. that are out there. You know, the the word I used to describe it was gruff. I think I think gruff. I took, yeah, I, I think I, I think I went with gruff <laughs> when, 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 I was, when I was when I was when I was running it down in my question. I was like, <laughs> he's gruff. Yeah. So, is he? You think is he naturally gruff, or is he gruff so people? You know, what I'm saying to hide to others how he really is. So is it naturally gruff or is it an act? Hmm. That's uh that's probably a question for his therapist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's yeah, I think that there's uh I think there's a natural gruffness to it. I think there there's definitely an element of, you know, he's he's in this position, he's given this status, so there's a mm -hmm. bit of a role that he's playing. And um yeah, I think it's it's probably a, a bit of a bit of both categories, really. Well, I think a great scene is that there's a scene in I'm probably gonna um, is it was it ten forward the the the, the food area that they have oh, yeah um, that, that's actually in uh, Pike's quarters yeah, Pike's quarters okay episode two. Um, yeah it was a great episode and I think what I found was interesting was that the way he interacted with Spock and Spock actually had showed a certain level level of levity which you don't usually get mm -hmm. with Spock and yeah. I was wondering. Do you think that comes with just being being the other alien on the ship that there's a connection there between these two characters or it, it was just well that's just a, a unique moment in the show yeah i i i sort of read it as being a, a connection between the two alien characters um and also yeah I, I think what's funny about about watching spock in this in this version of the show is sort of early spock so he's mm. trying out some things you know he hasn't he hasn't achieved his his number one level yet so he's still you know he's not a he's not a rookie but he's you know he's he's still trying out some stuff and i think mm. that, to me that moment kind of read as him like oh i'm i'm going to play along too and i'm going right, to right. i'm going <laughs> to i'm going to show it I, I heard what was the term i heard he was spock explaining 
which was to, <laughs> <laughs> in his Spock way of trying to help out. <laughs> but I thought it was a great moment between the two. And it does lend mm. me to think that those two characters belong together. I mean, for those of us who, once again, love the original Star Trek, you have Spock. And I kind of feel like Hammer's almost a Dr. McCoy personality that mm. does well with Spock. Yes, love it. Love you know, it. love that. Throw a little DeForest Kelly in there. Right, right. Sure. And and yeah. you know, if you really want to read into, it, you'd be like, hey, because that's why Spock did so well with McCoy because he was used to Hammer. If you know, if you want to make this weird <laughs> connection, this line that goes that sure. only I'm creating for myself. No, I love it. I love it. <laughs> all of those, all of that stuff for sure. Yeah, no, he, Hammer's just a warm up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Hammer also has a huge legacy before him. I mean. The, in Star Trek, there's the few characters that always get um, attention paid to them is the captain, the mm -hmm. first officer, and often the engineer. You yeah. know, you got you had Scotty, you have LaForge. I mean, it's a hell of a list that keeps going on. Yeah. Um, where does Hammer fit in that legacy? You think? I mean, what does his? What are his gifts that maybe the others may not possess? Where, where, where would you fit him in in your in your mind? Oh wow! Yeah, it's funny. I. I, I... I'm a big fan of of all of the series, and I often gravitate towards uh, the engineers in them. Um, you know, Trip Tucker to me was always well, he's just one of my favorites. So right, mm. right up to the end of Enterprise, <laughs> like that little the wink that he gives, just as he's oh anyway, I could go on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I I would like to think, and and the, the great thing about the engineers is that they're like they they often are the ones that have to find these creative solutions yep. to get the ship out of whatever trouble it is, and and you know it. it it occurred to me that, um, you know, what with the the Enar are are this race that are notorious pacifists, you know, and that's mm -hmm. and that's something that I think Hammer brings that, you know, it, it may have been implied in what the other engineers talk about, but but Hammer, I mean, it's explicit. He's a he's a pacifist, so he's not going to he's not going to be the one holding the phaser rifle, gunning things down, um, and I think that's very interesting that this uh, this pacifist. Who you know he he states that um, you know he's not going to fight, but he is going to fight for the ideals of Starfleet, and that there's mm. another way through. And I think that's that's certainly come up thematically throughout throughout the uh, the franchise of look for a compromise, look for a way to to solve a situation uh, that is through diplomacy, that is through conversation, mm. or whatever. And some, sometimes just okay, we're just gonna we're just gonna put a ban on visiting that planet or whatever because that's that's a no go zone, and we're gonna respect that and right, finding right. these diplomatic solutions. And and that's that's a uh, you know that's a, an active thing, and that's what pacifism. You know, and I think Hammer explicitly states that it's like, look, it's not about just sitting back in passivity. It's about finding another way, and there mm. there is an, an active. Uh, element to the passivity and the fact that the engineer of the enterprise the one who's actually getting the ship to move is a pacifist i think that that speaks to the heart of the whole franchise of, mm. you know, the, the only reason we're going where we're going is because we're doing it through uh other means than force by you know i mean and of course we had that beautiful prime directive or whatever it is code one no um <laughs> <laughs> right right right, right. <laughs> eventually eventually <laughs> yeah eventually <laughs> well I, I think that's an interesting kind of thing to think about about the engineer once again being a pacifist uh, once again which obviously for the fans you know nonviolent that kind of thing mm -hmm. however I mean, even though the enterprise is a science vessel it is part military so yeah. whether or not he's not firing the phasers if we use analogy of the gun he is the one loading the bullets and polishing the gun does he at all feel or will there be an issue or a conflict between what he wants to be doing behind the ship and what the ship may be doing at any given moment? Uh, I'd say that would certainly make for some pretty good television. How's that? Pretty good as in <laughs> great wow, conflict. For that'll sure. be exciting at some point in the near future or potentially in the future you know i mean how how interesting is that of an idea we will we'll, we'll let the writers uh play that one for sure yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. well done well done thank you um so as, as we mentioned earlier as well he is um the character is basically blind but he's also a, tel a, a telepath yes now the telepath as as has been you know sometimes we discuss in fiction is someone who knows potentially more than he would like to know about those around him because he can mm -hmm. hear the, the thoughts. And that's, I mean, there's there's kind of a, a curse of that. There, there was an episode of Supernatural, which is a show that I love, mm 
Mm. And there's a and one of the curses that when you pick up the phone, you're able to hear the thoughts of those around you, which usually are in positive and bad mm. things that happen to you because or you they drive the person crazy. Mm. How does the character like Hammer, especially one that is gruff, or maybe that's be, maybe that's why he's so gruff? Mm. Um, how's it handle? Does he handle knowing what everyone is thinking, not only of each other but him? Yeah, that's and that's actually I think brought up in when the Enar are introduced in Enterprise. They have a very strict code about not reading someone's thoughts and not actually using their telepathy for that. And it's even amongst themselves, like there has to be uh, express consent before you before you actually read anyone's thoughts. And um, I think that Hammer certainly uh, adheres to that rule. And uh, I would I just imagine that that would be an incredible. That'd be an incredible weight to have to bear. Um, mm. But if it's, you know, I think if it's a cultural thing, then, you know, he's had enough practice at it to, to be able to, to follow that, that dictum. Do you think that's a rule for themselves or a rule for, to help others? Once again, the same idea being, obviously it's for courtesy of others, but at the same time, once again, what would that do to mm. them having to hear everyone's thoughts all the time? Would that be, so whose favor is that for? I, well, it would. I think it would probably start at home. I think it would be for themselves first, and then mm. certainly in, in within the culture, it's like, yeah, it's a, probably a little better that we don't actually read each other's minds all the time. Otherwise, <laughs> um, you know, it would be the end of marriage. Uh, as I say, as someone who's married, <laughs> thank God I don't have that power. Or my wife doesn't have that power. I'd be fine with it, probably. At least I don't know why she's angry. But my mm. wife would probably <laughs> telemarketers would never call. It would just be chaos. Yes, it would be. <laughs> So, so when you received the role of Commander Hammer, right, were you given a backstory for the character? Did you devise your own? How mm. much discussion was there between you and the writers and maybe even the other characters about how much is or should be known about Hammer? When I got the, the initial script, it was, um, uh, what was the first scene I read? I guess it was, it was actually the, the dinner uh, introduction with uh, Uhura. That was the first scene that I read. So I, I knew that he had telepathy that he had an extraordinary extraordinary gifts he was able to you know kind of read and and do all the things that an engineer would need to do uh using his telepathy um i dug back into enterprise and watched the introduction uh episodes of of the enar and then i, I binged the whole season again series again um dug into the andorian histories uh, dug around on memory alpha to figure out as much as i possibly could about the enar and then beyond that it was really just whatever whatever breadcrumbs were put into the scripts uh that i was going to be digging around and figuring out hammer's backstory um yeah a lot of imagination just in that but honestly mm. the scripts are so full of of just the the immediate action and that's what i love about strange new worlds i mean we just kind of pick up and then it's like go and uh, right, right. trouble trouble <laughs> trouble trouble trouble, <laughs> trouble and solution and then you know Dana right, right, right. Uh, which is uh, which is awesome i mean you just kind of you just kind of ride it that way and and suss out and fill out the backstory as much as you as you want i mean the 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 writing of him is is pretty much exactly how it comes across i hope anyway on on screen it's it he's he's gruff he's to the point i, I mean one of his first lines is i'm a genius <laughs> so right, right. He's going, okay that's 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 what he says about himself and you know some other people seem to concur so i'll just, I'll just put that in the uh, in the actor journal or whatever i was doing at the time maybe it's a comic, <laughs> a comic book or something <laughs> well i mean the one difference between Strange New Worlds and Discovery and Picard is that the stories don't continue that way. There, are, these are um, episodes that exist individually. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's still some carryover. Obviously, what's going on with Pike and his future is a carryover. But for the most part, yeah. these are individualized stories. Um, and like I said, like Discovery. So when you're performing them, are you taking bits from previous episodes and carry it on? Do you take them as new show new episode follow us in the script or are you trying to carry on with what's come before you know it's a it's certainly building on on the episodes that have come before um they the, you know as you say that the stories themselves are are pretty contained um there's there's hints there's there's some relationship shifts throughout um between the characters but yeah it's uh it's yeah it's a little bit of both really i mean the beautiful thing about it is that you don't, or at least the characters don't seem to 
end the same way that they started. It's not like a big reset. You're still learning mm. a little little pieces about what had come before and that and kind of brings them together. I think a classic example of that, at least from Strange New Worlds, is the discovery of Dr. Mbenga's daughter. And mm. I go, oh, okay, so there's a little bit of another layer there. And it's, it's certainly right. giving some indication as to his motivations in later episodes. Why is he why is he a bit like that? And I think we'll we'll certainly learn some of mm. what uh, what drives Hammer in that way as well. Yeah, I mean, like I, said, I think you're, I mean, the, the character of Hammer that you're playing, I mean, he's such a fantastic character. And he, he's definitely the more, one of the more fun characters on Star Trek Trains of which at the moment, like most other characters are handled kind of straight. And Hammer gives it just a little bit of that, that little extra cute dark humor that you're like, yeah. I like that guy. You know what I'm saying? It's, 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 <laughs> yeah. you know, a little, little gallo humor, a little kind of, you know, he's someone who would be fun, I think, the most fun to talk to in that group. At least in my opinion. Great. Love to hear it. <laughs> so, I mean, once again, because as you said, the character is uh, blind and, you know, obviously you have a uh, vision as well. When you're being directed, are you, are they coming to you on how you would want to handle something? Are you going, you know, are you taking just direction how Hammer would handle it? Because once again, your view of the world is unique for Hammer mm. than most people. Yeah, that was, that was a question right from the start. Um not even or not even not just uh you know what i was doing in front of the camera but right from the very beginning my my concern was um you know being on a film set and what that was going to be like for a visually impaired uh, actor because i i had really not done much film and tv before my world was theater and mm. you know we have you know sometimes two three weeks of rehearsal to figure out how something's going to work so i can learn the stage i can i can rehearse the thing to death and i can take it home and figure out how i'm going to maneuver mm. throughout the space whereas on a film set i mean you go in you do your your shot and then you sit uh, off off screen and when you come back it's like the whole environment has changed it's like mm. same room but the camera's in a different place and then right. now there's a crane shot and it's like there's going to be you know there's a boom in your face or whatever and <laughs> right, right. Uh, for me that was just like okay i i could be a serious liability here because i I don't know suddenly that I'm I'm going to walk off the screen and, and walk directly into a, a camera or something. Mm. But uh, the production end of it just said that's absolutely no problem. And when I arrived, I had an assistant who was there to help me maneuver th from from getting from prosthetics to on on set. And then when once we were on set, there were people there right away to say, "Look, here's where the camera is, and this is what, how we're going to be tracking. When you step off here, there's going to be a, like there is just so much care given." that any uh, nervousness that I might have had as an actor walking into that situation was gone and I could just go, okay, great, I'm, I'm super confident with that. And so that's going to lead into the confidence that I can bring to the role of Hammer. And then in terms of what I and how Hammer was maneuvering through the space, I mean, all those questions that I had of like, okay, so how does his telepathy work? Like, is he, mm. is, is he able to to sense where people are and as soon as somebody starts speaking does he know immediately who that person is i mean for myself it's like if i know your voice i will be able to recognize you but it mm. could take me a while and oftentimes people will say hey bruce it's it's so and so and they'll let me know who's actually speaking because i i don't see faces uh but with hammer it was like oh well obviously he's gonna he's gonna know because he can see them through his mm. telepathy um, and then, of course, all the questions with the technology. It's like, wait a minute, okay, so he can't see these all of this visual uh, information that's in front of him. I mean, it's very engineering. It's just all screens and buttons mm. and pads. And I mean, I can learn the keyboard and I can type without having to see it. But what about like a screen itself? It's like, well, yeah, well, with his telepathy, he would actually be able to read the heat coming off of various areas and the electrical impulses, he would be able to feel that. And there are moments where it's like, oh yeah, he can he can actually feel, oh, there's energy moving through this conduit and like all of that stuff mm. that it, it really is that heightened sense of, yeah, he does. He sees better, like significantly better than even someone with full eyesight. So uh, in a lot of ways, I just had to go, okay, well, if the script says I'm going to do this, then I'll just make, use my imagination to figure mm. out how somebody with daredevil like senses is like yeah okay like i can do that <laughs> it always bugged me that matt murdoch had to use a white cane but i think that was just part of the disguise it was like right 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 glasses right? Like, <laughs> i think I so mean, he's an acrobat who can dodge a bullet he's not blind <laughs> right I, I think in the comic books doesn't it, that doesn't i think turn into like this lot like almost not like a battery but um a, a rope that uses to swing from things so I, yeah i think it's just part oh of yeah the act. yeah he's got yeah. he's got the, the, the super <laughs> cane that's like a billion right, right, right. and he can yeah he's Amazing, amazing. So, I mean, Hemmer's um, te telepathy is a very handy tool. Um, I mean, it gives him a benefit from the rest of the crew in certain situations. Hmm. 
would I would it be fair to bet that at some point does this give him a leg up on certain situations that may occur on the ship that we'll be exploring? Well, you know, we've seen that in in uh, I think the third episode where he he does the the stuff with the energy and is manages to get the away team beamed up. So we definitely see that skill. Um, also, like this incredible scene where he's trying to beam up a part of the planet. Right. You know, <laughs> that, was, like, that, that was absolutely what? genius. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. If you, if you needed to have a serious heat source and a light source, I guess it would be from the <laughs> core of the planet. Um, <laughs> yeah. And all the engineers were like, genius. Um, <laughs> yeah, for sure. And and certainly we're going to be seeing uh, Hammer's incredible skills come into play. Uh, stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, it does make you wonder. I mean, the cool thing about that scene where he's beaming up the core was again genius, but that's some dangerous shit he screwed around. I mean, how <laughs> dangerous is potentially this guy who can do all these things if he's in the wrong mood? Apparently. Oh yeah, exactly. It's, it's like if he ever turns bad, look out. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but I mean, like I said, that's potentially extremely scary. But um, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. once again, though. Um, extreme, you know, extremely like obviously made it to commander, so you must have a long history in the fleet as well. Yeah, which sure. I would imagine should also eventually be touched upon. Oh, that backstory, yeah, for sure. It's uh, I, I, I wish I could say more about uh, what's coming up, but um, yeah, learning well, and this was this was the kind of great fun for me is thinking about getting to that position, like what Hammer must have gone through in order mm. to do that. First of all, is an Enar. Uh, like we, I don't think we've seen another Enar. No, we haven't. We haven't seen another Enar in Starfleet. So is he the very first of his kind? I don't know. Mm. Um, but uh, just dig around. And, and, and the fact that he gets to that position, I mean, that's that's really something. It's pretty extraordinary to be the chief engineer on the, on the flagship. And... Um, yeah, how he got there. That uh, well, I can't wait for the spinoff. Frankly, it's, right, right. Well, it's uh, the I, Hammer and Linus backstory <laughs> that is like, wow, how did that happen? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I couldn't help but think. I mean, are you mentally prepared to be a toy and probably in comic books uh, now? This, I mean, oh yeah, no, that's that, I've been preparing for that since grade three. <laughs> <laughs> will Will you buy your own action figure? One hundred percent. <laughs> I don't. I don't think that's ego at all. That's just. That's just good, uh, solid uh, co collecting. <laughs> will, you, will you take it out of the package, or will you leave it uh, and pose it, or will you keep it in the package? Oh, very good question. Uh, well, I would probably buy two. So there's the one that stays in the package <laughs> and goes into the uh, the time capsule, and then there's the other one that that gets opened up and gets taken out and, and passed around the campfire. Good. See, I don't say toys, take them out to play. That, that, that's, that's what I always say. <laughs> <laughs> so once again, as you mentioned the prosthetics, how difficult has it been to get used to that aspect of the character? Not too difficult. I, I did a lot of mask work when I was uh, in theater and, and continue to do quite a, a fair amount of mask work. And that's really what the prosthetics, uh, the, the, you know, the foundation of it is, is doing that kind of mask uh, wearing. It's the three and a half hours in the prosthetic chair uh, before I even get to set. So sometimes we were getting there at 5.30 in the morning just to get prepared uh, to start the day. And it was, uh, there, so there were two technicians, artists, um, artis artisans, uh, <laughs> Alan Cook and Shane Zander, who worked primarily with me. And yeah, from like three and a half hours straight, you know, we would take the, a little bit of a water break or whatever, but I mean, mm. you're, you're kind of under the gun to get it done. And I mean, they're really uh, just incredible. It was it was amazing to watch them work. That you know, there's a the technical aspect of just gluing the, the 15 pieces on. You know, starting with the ball cap and then covering up all the hair and then starting to glue the pieces. That all that technical stuff and making sure that it gets that it sits right. And then once all the pieces are in place, then they paint it. And so this the artistic side starts to come in, where it's getting the shadows and the highlights and making sure the colors blend correctly. And then all throughout the day while we're on set they're there to do touch-ups and to fix everything up and so it really felt like i had a bit of a pit crew so it's, <laughs> uh, it was like cut and then you know alan and shane would rush in and it's like oh make sure his teeth are right and get the blue dye in his mouth and then, okay go and, then, and they're sitting back and they're watching it and then you know, all the takes on the screen they come in and they fix something else up and at the end of the day uh, it's another hour to get out of all the pro you know un get mm. all the glue off and then take all the makeup off and i mean they're really just uh, they're incredible and really you know we'd been in lockdown you know we didn't start shooting until 2021 and 
you know, it had been almost a year in lockdown and this was kind of my first contact with other human beings. And so <laughs> it really felt like, oh, hey, we're hanging out and it's, you know, we're, we're actually getting to know each other. And, and they're, honestly, they're just such great guys. Like mm. we had, uh, three and a half hours would just blow by. We'd listen to music and we'd talk about, you know, Frank Zappa or He-Man mm. or whatever, just kind of nerd <laughs> out together. And, and honestly, it was just, it was just the most amazing thing. So um, yeah, it really, it really just flew by and, and I honestly, I loved it. I, I loved it being able to just kind of disappear and become somebody wholly other. Mm. And, you know, at the end of the day, because I would often be the last one out, uh, um, you know, unless I had shot an early scene and it was cut for the day. But there were a couple of times where I'd get out of prosthetics and I would kind of leave my trailer and I'd walk by and then handsome would go, what, what? Who's that? <laughs> Who are you? Why are you coming out of Hammer's trailer? <laughs> you know, this, this, this skinny dude coming out wearing a Spinal Tap t-shirt. And he's like, I have no idea who that is. Like, hey, Anson, it's Bruce. Um, but yeah, it just completely... And all, actually, uh, at the premiere in New York, um, before before we uh, we went off to all the, the press gatherings and things, we had a, like kind of a private luncheon with the cast, and Rebecca Romaine came up, and she looked at me, and she said, oh, my... Bruce, what? What? She had never seen me out of prosthetics before, so that was yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. So, I mean, everyone who knows um, anything about film and TV, they know that most of these things are shot out of order. Do yeah. they at least let you get all your scenes in together so you only have to do the makeup thing once, or you, or, or, or are they making you do the makeup thing five minutes scene, get you tomorrow, do the whole thing all over again five minutes more? It, you know, it was every oh, wow. I mean, what I love loved 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 about working in film and tv was that it was never the same day twice mm. you know in theater you you work every day and what you're trying to do is get a repeatable product and so by the time you're up and running it's like you want the day to kind of go the same it's like you arrive you have your little thing and then you do your show and everything kind of runs in order and there's no mm. major surprises and and at the end of the day it's like yeah if you've had the same day you've done a good job and with film and tv it's like if you're going back and doing the same thing there's been a horrible mistake <laughs> <laughs> and and somebody's getting yelled at because of whatever and right, right. i just loved it i love that you would, i would show up and i I might know the pages that we were working on uh, from the night before we'd get our sides or whatever, um, and maybe the, the basic running order. But it, no, honestly, it was never the same. And there were some days where I would show up and I would, you know, go through the whole process and the rigmarole and I would go in for, um, you know, 10 or 15 minutes of shooting and then it was a back into the chair to get them out. And then there were other days where I was the first one in and I was the last one to leave after 14 hours. Oh, wow. So, um, and yeah, what an what an extraordinary experience. And again, it's just, you know, I think that um, years of working in improv improv improvisation kind of geared me up for that. I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna roll with it and say yes to whatever they throw at us. And mm. yeah, I just absolutely love that because again, off off the page. It read one way, and then you get in there, and it's like, oh, we're gonna. There's like six cameras, and they're gonna shoot it this way. And it's like, oh, okay, like mm. kind of just gotta, you gotta be flexible and 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 ready to to play with whatever they throw at you. So, are you ready for the the amount of yes love, <laughs> the amount of love you're gonna get from the Star Trek family? I mean, the amount of fans uh, you have for Star Trek, and the yeah. dedication of those fans is so massive. I mean. You kind of entered this massive, massive world that's oh, yeah. going to be, you know, there's, uh, I mean, it's a loving fan base. It's a supportive fan base, so but cool. they're also probably a little bit um, dedic over dedicated sometimes too. I mean, are you ready for all this? <laughs> I love it. You know, from the very first moment that it was announced, this is back in, I think it was October when Star Trek Day announced and they showed my little teaser of you know introducing myself and introducing hammer and it was like not even a minute later that my facebook was starting to <laughs> pop up with messages people saying oh my god you're in star trek and this is so exciting and just like welcome to the family was one of the very first messages i got and i mean that's just that just says everything because uh it is it's an extraordinary family and just like all families you know every member of the family has their opinion and has their their quirks and their foibles and uh, but it's all coming from love and that's that's mm. what I, I i sincerely appreciate about it and i i mean i'm a fan myself i was raised on star trek like sci-fi is just in my blood and so mm. and star trek especially um 
and I watched the original series on reruns and the animated series and just absolutely everything. My my dad had the comic books and like the the photo novels of the television shows and it's mm. just you know I love it all and and absolutely every grain of it I think is 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 delightful and you know all of the all of the 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 beautiful triumphs and the and the tragic mistakes I just kind of embrace and go yeah like that's that's mm. it's a beautiful franchise for that um and anytime that someone finds a plot hole or someone has like the 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 question of like yeah but would you and and all of that I go yeah but this is coming from someone who who cares enough first mm. of all to watch the thing who cares enough to you know, go back and pause that moment on, on, on the screen and say, wait a minute, there's there's not that many decks on the Enterprise. Like, it shouldn't be 16, it should be 16 and, or whatever. It's like, I love all of that, that dedication to the detail. I mean, I'm sure it is absolutely infuriating for the writers and, and on right. the team on the other side is like, yeah, but I just want to write an episode where they do this <laughs> thing. It's like, but you can't do that thing unless you, you know, wreck the laws of Roddenberry. Or right, right. <laughs> there are no zippers. Oh, like, oh, come on. But we have to have, we need pockets <laughs> for this one scene. <laughs> I, I, I don't envy the writers for that. But the other side of it is that because it's, it, you know, it's fiction and you can just, you know, you can just write a little, now there's this new law and this, or this new theory and it's like mm. have you ever heard of you know dark matter or whatever no there is actually dark matter but you yes. can come up with <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. orange matter right, right. Sudden, suddenly we have this new element and, and the only reason we have that new element is so that we can have pockets on our spacesuits well hey um uh, what was it uh the first structure was it red matter the thing that blew up like a and it was like anti-black hole something or other it was yeah. like, kind of like red matter something. i was like <laughs> yeah. i know what that's supposed to be but sure <laughs> why not but sure yeah if it if it gives us another season then i will be 100 percent behind <laughs> right. orange matter <laughs> <laughs> so what can you tell us about what to expect from the upcoming episodes of Strange New Worlds? Well, I, I, I can't tell you much. I can tell you that um, there are more adventures of the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just get into vagaries, really. But, um, you know, it... <sighs> is there a Hammer-centric episode? Hammer definitely shows up more. Yeah, Good. yeah. Um, yeah and and that is so it's just so much fun um uh what was what was challenging about shooting during the pandemic was the real lack of getting to hang out you know mm. between takes we were you know the the protocols that they were following for very good reasons you know you're looking at like thousands of people counting on this show going ahead and being on schedule and so if somebody's getting sick then everything's going down and the production's just going to get slowed down so we were getting tested repeatedly like uh, <laughs> i have a terrible joke where i say in the last year i've had more things up my nose than johnny depp but i think that, <laughs> might, be, <laughs> that might be off color anyway no um uh so yes, the 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 amount of the the strictness of it led to I think the thing coming together when it did, and and that was great. But what it meant was that there was there was just no socializing. So the the amount of time that we got to actually just hang out and and be a cast kind of cohesing cohesing co co. <laughs> Whatever the word is, hey, uh, you that's know, a Star Trek word. We're cohesive. You're Commander right? Hammer. You can be, and you can say any words you want at this point. <laughs> <laughs> that that was that was minimal. Um, so the the episodes where I got to come and and be in like the big group scenes meant just being able to to connect with people and and that was just such a, a such a treat and such a joy and and recognizing that wow like there are so there's a there's Ooh. just so much talent on that show uh i i learned just an infinite amount of, of work or of stuff about acting on film and tv not only in front of the camera but just like when you're hanging out and conserving energy and like how do you how do you ramp up at 11 45 for <laughs> to do like a really intense scene right, right. um all of that stuff so you know it was it was a real chance for me to just to sit back and observe and also being in prosthetics meant like i gotta be i gotta be pretty careful with you know not overexerting myself because it's it's pretty exhausting being in all that uh silicon latex latex plastic. I think. yeah, <laughs> I think it's uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's uh I've, I've completely lost track of what your question was what uh, whether there's more hammer yes there's more hammer there's 
There's well, always room for Hammer. <laughs> I would hope so. Like I said, he really, I think, is a fascinating character. Definitely a unique one, especially in the world of Star Trek that does tend to have very perfect type individuals that have Horak who's um, mm. sorry, I say Horak, you're, you're not the character. <laughs> Separate the two. Hammer. Yeah. Uh, to, to Hammer, you know, give him a little extra, this kind of roughness to him and whatnot is, I think, uh, a pleasure to have on the show. Oh, and I want to thank you so much for doing such a great job with the character and making thank the show so. that much better. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's been such a treat. <laughs> Thank you.